Hello everyone! Today we are actually going through some really fantastic Dungeon Master tips with Chris Perkins. We've got a great new book out. Fandelver and Below, The Shattered Obelisk. Fantastic. Let's just kind of dive in. You've obviously got a lot of Dungeon Master knowledge under your hat. So what was some of your best advice for those who are a player or maybe completely new to D&D trying to figure out like, is this the moment I should be Dungeon Mastering? Is this the moment to take the leap? Well, um, Todd, for those who don't know me, I'm Chris Perkins. I'm one of the game architects of Dungeons & Dragons, and I have been DMing since I was 10 years old, which is a long time. Let's just leave it at that. But I put together a presentation that I first gave at the recent San Diego Comic-Con, and then did an updated version of that presentation at Gen Con. And this, what we're doing now, is sort of a, a version of that. It is uh, this presentation I put together, which is aimed at both new and experienced DMs. So I'm going to basically walk through the roles that a dungeon master plays, and then we're going to have a little fun along the way, giving tips and uh, offering some advice for some situations that do come up in the course of a game. My hope, after you've watched this, if you're a new DM, you'll come away thinking, oh, there are some helpful tips here. If you're an experienced DM, you might go away thinking, well, I didn't learn anything new, but I feel validated. <laughs> <laughs> that's very fair. Yeah, yeah, that's my... <laughs> uh, so without further ado, first question is, what is a dungeon master? A, a world builder. B, a storyteller. C, a referee. Or D, all of the above. Uh, I feel like D... <laughs> D is the correct answer. Perfect. Yes. I but have survived. It's more than that. A dungeon master is also an actor, a director, a teacher, and an improviser. That is a lot of roles for one person to play at the table. And all of us DMs are better at some of those roles than others. And those of us who have been DMing a long time have found tips or tricks or ways to sort of... Um, up our game in the areas or the roles where we're not the most comfortable or the most able. Right. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of this presentation is take each of these dungeon mastering roles and give one tried and true tip and then intersperse a few little uh, Q&As in between. So the first thing is world building. The dungeon master is a world builder. That means that the dungeon master is responsible for creating the setting in which the campaign or the adventures happen. And there's a lot to a campaign setting to think about. Uh, if you're thinking about it on the world scale, it can be quite daunting, which is why my tip for world building is start small. It can be very tempting to bite off more of the campaign than you can chew or more of the campaign that the players will even experience. Right. And DMs are busy people. They have lives. They don't have infinite amount of time to get their setting off the ground. But if you start small, you have a better chance of actually creating content that the players will experience and use and enjoy. And by small, I mean maybe your campaign starts at a village. So detail the village. Uh, define some of the personalities of the NPCs who live there. Flesh out some of the locations that are important. And then if there are areas around the village, like maybe there's a dungeon nearby or a haunted castle or a ruined tower on a hilltop, these close-by locations can serve as the starting places for the characters to explore in their early adventures. That is enough of a campaign right there to, to get things off the ground. Right there, you've got several sessions of play that can happen. Um, starting small uh, means that you won't waste a lot of effort describing places that the characters might never go to. Uh, so question, where should one keep one's campaign notes? Oh, wow. I'm a, terrible about this. <laughs> in a journal or notebook. Right. B, in folders on a computer. C, in a wiki. Or D, in an online virtual tabletop. Whatever works best for you. Correct. <laughs> yes. All of those answers are fine. Um, it was a trick question. There yeah. wasn't just one correct answer. <laughs> it is a matter of DM choice. And uh, one of the beats I'll hit later is that DMs are individuals. They have their own ways of organizing their information. And however works best for you is great. I, for many years, had a campaign in a wiki that the, characters, that the player characters could actually add to. Mm -hmm. uh, that was helpful. 
Um, but my stock and trade is keeping a journal and a notebook as well as some computer files. Um, but whatever floats your boat. Perfect. Another question, how much time should be spent preparing for a game session? A, none. <laughs> B, an hour or two at most. C, as many hours as you can spare. Or D, depends. I'm going to have to go with depends. I have been burned many <laughs> you heard times. It here. Todd wants to go with depends. Yeah. Oh, I'll get there, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but you are correct. The answer is it really does depend. Um, you might be playing D&D at the drop of a hat, like at a moment's notice, without any prep, in which case you just don't have time to prepare, and that's totally valid. Um, you may be running a pre-published adventure that doesn't require a lot of prep. Great. For you, preparation might be the most fun activity of DMing, and so you will invest as much time as you can into it. And that's marvelous, because it's a wonderful escape. Uh, so it really just depends on the individual and the circumstances of the game that you're going to be playing. So for those who are curious, my typical prep for my campaigns consists of, one, a campaign recap, which I write ahead of time. It's basically like a paragraph of text, and it's similar to what a lot of TV series do to get people up to speed on what's happened if it's a serialized story. Previously, yeah. in this campaign, and the reason I write that recap ahead of time is uh, one of the things I like to do in planning for the current session is to look back through my notes to see if there's anything that happened in the past that needs to be brought forward or is going to be relevant or important, and I want to remind the players that that happened. And so I will craft the recap looking into the past, just a very quick nutshell summary, so the characters, so the players at the very start of the session are reminded of all the important details to sort of frame what I expect to happen in the game coming. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And you never know what what is going to spark like a new idea in you, especially yes. coming from the past. Yes, and it might be quite short. It might be as simple as previously in the last session, your characters helped this uh, mountaineer out of a snowdrift defended him against a pair of attacking crag cats, and then with his help, marched up the mountain to the Yeti cave. You know, it might be as simple as that, or there might be more to it. Right. I also, as part of my prep, create a list of friendlies and a list of foes. Uh, it's just an NPC list, basically. A reminder to me of which NPCs do I think are going to surface in the game. Um, if I write down their names, it means I won't forget them or mix them up later. I also create a very, very short bulleted list of planned events and encounters. Now, an, an experienced DM knows that players often take the game in unexpected directions, but that's okay. As part of my prep, though, I still like to anticipate where the session is likely to go. Like, th I expect this thing to happen first, then I expect them to do some shopping, then I expect them to march to this location, and then I expect this big thing to happen. That way, at least I've thought about it. Right. Um, there might be no details there. It's just basically me thinking mentally of where the session will begin and where I expect it will end and what do I think will happen in between. And more often than not, I'm proved wrong. Something comes up unexpectedly, but right. that's fine. I've thought about it. And then finally, my last bit of prep is, if necessary, a map. If there's a location that they're going to explore and there's already a map for it, I just need to have that map ready. If it's a new location and I feel like I need a map for it, I'll either create one or I'll go on the internet and find one. So the Dungeon Master is also a storyteller. And what I mean by that is the DM takes care of the setup and while the player characters are the ones kind of driving the story by their choices and actions, the DM always has to be in lockstep with them and prepared to um, react to their actions and decisions and kind of lead the story along. In, in some cases, if the story gets stuck or mired, also sort of digging it out of the mud or um, pointing out the options to the players so they know what the possibilities are. The DM also will, over time, learn a lot about their players and their players' tastes and their players' predilections. 
and that will inform storytelling down the road. Like if your players tend to be a violent bunch, <laughs> the DM will plan stories that cater to that, that type. Whereas if they're more investigative or more into role playing, the DM is shaping the stories in line with what the characters and the player's expectations are. But my tip for storytellers is this. Talk less, listen more. Why? I'm afraid to ask. I was just instructed to talk less. <laughs> <laughs> because um, you do want the players to be invested in, in the story you're telling. And the more they talk, the more invested they are. But also, as a DM, your players will do a lot of your work for you. If okay. you just listen to their interplay and their discussions, they will fill your head with ideas. They will give you things that you, uh, or, or ways to take the story that you didn't even think of yourself. And being a good listener, um, uh, you can plan what's going to happen while they're talking. It is my favorite thing to watch players just spiral and you you just watch it happen. Mm -hmm. It's the best feeling as a dungeon master where you don't actually have to do anything. You just watch it unfold yes. amongst them. Another trick that I use uh, as part of this um, talk less and listen more is when I'm describing, when I'm setting up a scene and describing the scene, I'll be very, very brief, minimalistic in details. Like at the end of the road, you see a crumbled down stone vineyard. Full stop. Let the players ask for details. You know, uh, are there any, is there anybody about? Why, yes, you see there's something shambling in the vineyard to the left of the crumbled down building. Then they'll ask me another question, you know, uh, and I'll, they'll just keep asking me questions and I will feed them information. Uh, basically only giving them as much description as they need. So question, what should I do if a character dies? <laughs> A, cackle with delight. B, tell the character's player to do better next time. <laughs> C, have snakes erupt from the dead character's corpse. Yeah. Or D, discuss options with the dead character's player. Can it be option A and D at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Definitely not B. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that the correct answer is have snakes erupt from the dead character's corpse. Okay. Perfect. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The real answer is discuss options with the dead character's player. Right. Often when death occurs, it's unexpected. It might be the result of bad dice rolls um, or just a bad decision. And uh, in that case, uh, it's basically spelling the end of a character's journey or a character's arc. Yeah. And some players are prepared for that. Uh, some players actually greet their character's death with a fair measure of enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, particularly if they're the type of player who's got like a lineup of other characters that they've built and they're just aching to play something else. Yes. You know the type. Yes. And so death is not that, doesn't come with any trauma or, or any, um, um, you know, resentment or yeah. anything like that. But you never know. And so as a DM, it's always good to say, okay, this happened. Take the player aside or just have a conversation and say, do you think your character's journey is over at this point? Are you happy with the situation? Or at least are you ready to move on from that character? Or would you like to discuss other possibilities? In D&D, there is plenty of ways for characters to come back from the dead. Um, and working with your player, you might be able to contrive something fun um, not only the character coming back from the dead, but maybe with a vision that they had while they were dead. Maybe while they were dead, they actually had some sort of weird extra planar interaction mm -hmm. uh, that, that might propel the character's story even further along. It might be divine intervention or some other encounter. Uh, but there are all kinds of ways to skin it. But I think that it's smart for the DM and the player to both agree on the course of action with regards to that character and their journey just so it doesn't feel like it's incomplete right? Yeah. and unsatisfying. Another question, how do I make my players care about my campaign? A, make the campaign about their characters. B, create likable non-player characters and antagonists. C, have the characters' actions come back to haunt them. Or D, avoid predetermined outcomes. 
I'd argue it's their campaign, not just yours. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of the above, and I've very specifically run into an issue of my villains are so unlikable that they just don't want to be involved with them at all. And that is definitely something I've had happen before. Where, like you need them to have like something cool about them or interesting. Or, yeah, like, exactly. Need to have depth. Yes. So uh, I believe you are correct that all of these are the right answer. If you make the campaign about the characters, the players will have more investment in the campaign. And one of the easy ways to do that is to tie events into their backgrounds or their classes or, or their other character choices that they made. You know, if they've defined that they have relationships in the campaign, you know, allowing the campaign to explore those relationships can be very gratifying. Um, the likable non-player characters is also important because if even if they're unlikable in terms of their behavior, <laughs> yeah, yeah, players will like a good villain, and yeah. they will invest more in the world if they care about the people who live there or enjoy spending time in the company of the people who live there. And then having the characters' actions come back to haunt them is important because it creates a verisimilitude of the world. Like their like actions have consequences. The characters did something, and this thing happened. They may not know the consequences immediately. Right. Those consequences might sneak up on them. But what that does is it creates a depth to your world and it creates that moment of, oh crap, look what we did. We have to fix this because this is a problem we created. And that creates investment. And then avoiding predetermined outcomes. What I mean by that is if your players feel like you're just kind of got them on a railroad to a destination and they can't get off, right. then their investment goes down because they realize they actually have no influence over where the campaign is going. But a clever DM will guide them to where you want to go while still giving the full, like a range of choice, or at least the illusion of choice, so that players do feel like their action, like they're helping to steer the campaign. And if they have that feeling, they'll be invested. Right. Moving on to the dungeon master as a referee, a very important role that dungeon masters play. Um, my advice to DMs on being a referee is this. The rules serve you, not the other way around. Right. And what I mean by that is the rules of D&D &D exist to, uh, as like guideposts. A situation comes up and you don't know how to resolve it. The rules are there to give you a framework to resolve it. But every play group is unique. DMs will often customize their play experience for their particular group. Um, say you're playing with smaller children who don't know the rules that well, uh, but love the idea of getting into character and going off on an adventure and just like uncovering rocks and looking in tree holes and things like that. Um, a DM can run a version of D&D that sort of pairs a lot of the rules down. Um, similarly, in, in just a more typical game, DMs often have house rules that they've introduced because their players have a particular style that they like. Or the DM has decided that the campaign is of a particular genre or style that needs tweaks to the rules. Maybe it's harder to heal or magic is more rare or whatever. Whatever, whatever the situation, the rules are there to help you. They don't dictate your campaign. That's perfect. So question, hypothetical. The Goliath Barbarian wants to ride the hostile owlbear. <laughs> How should I resolve this? A, don't allow it. B, allow a die roll to determine the outcome. C, look up the rules for grappling a creature. Or D, ask your players for suggestions. I, I like B, C, and D. I hate A. <laughs> I don't want to ever tell players no. I'm amused by a dice roll that goes wrong. The potential there is too much. Uh, I mm -hmm. also like other players, like, you know, everyone giving their advice on that. I would argue that all of these are valid. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, starting from the bottom and working up, asking your players for suggestions, you know, you're, you may be the DM, but you don't have to know everything. If you don't know how to resolve a situation, players at the table might actually be able to suggest something to you, and if you like it, you can adopt it. If you want to look up the rules for grappling a creature because you think that might actually help resolve the situation, mm -hmm. that's actually great. But the rules exist to serve you. You don't have to 
necessarily know how to resolve the situation, but if you think of something in the rules that might help you, go to that rule and see if it works. Allowing a die roll to determine the outcome is always fine and always acceptable. Uh, the dice are great for, for doing that. Uh, and if they roll high enough, you just allow it. Yeah. The one that you, you chafed at <laughs> yes. is the don't allow it. But I would argue that there are situations where that is the valid way to handle the situation. Right. What happens if the Goliath Barbarian is unconscious? Perfect. Should you allow the player to ride the owlbear? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. That's... There, there are things that can be true in game, situations that might actually prevent that character from doing what they want to do. Yeah. Like and a halfling it... with five strength. Like, <laughs> you know, even that might be a long shot. It might have a high CR, but if, there, yeah, yeah. if there's a wall of force between the halfling and the owlbear, then yes, you there's could, no you, realistic way. You finally got me one. I'm on. Yes. <laughs> I, thought, and... I thought you were messing with me by giving me three positives and one negative. <laughs> I have failed. I have failed. <laughs> All right. Another question. Well, okay. What if the owlbear is friendly instead? Okay. A, allow the barbarian to succeed automatically. B, require a successful ability check against a, a DC-5, an easy DC. Um, C, same as B, but with a higher DC, because riding an owlbear should never be easy. <laughs> Or D, trick question, owlbears are never friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, that in itself is a trick question. It's still all of them. Because, <laughs> well, there are friendly owlbears probably. I think I've seen, witnessed you make an owlbear friendlier than they are potentially designed to be. Uh, yeah. People are very attached to owlbears, despite the fact that true. most of them want to rip your face off. Yeah, true. Uh, I would argue that all of these are acceptable answers. You can allow the Barbarian to succeed automatically. You can require an ability check at a low DC or at a higher DC. And uh, you may decide, in your world, owlbears are never friendly. Yeah. Yeah. As the DM, you get to make that call. Now, replace owlbear with, you know, kraken or dragon or whatever monster you want. You will eventually come to a monster for which this for which the answer is, well, you know what? Uh, you're never going to find a friendly gray ooze right? Aww. in my campaign. Well, now I want a friendly gray ooze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question. One player is hogging the spotlight. Uh. What should I do? A, after the game, have a private chat with that player. B, make it clear when you're shining the spotlight on other players. Mm. C, Ensure every player character has moments to shine. D, dump that player if they're spoiling everyone else's fun. So it's definitely potentially all of them because, um, and I really like what you mentioned about letting people know when the spotlight is on them and establishing that. But yeah, if it becomes, it's definitely become a problem that tables have been at before where you kind of have this first character syndrome that occurs or only character syndrome and other other characters, other players may not be accustomed to giving themselves the spotlight. Like some people are just either they're playing a character who is quieter and more subtle, or they themselves are a quieter person that needs that spotlight on them and have that opportunity to talk up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we have, we yeah, have all, all of them. All of these are viable options. Um, having the private chat with the player uh, just to let them know that there is an issue is great. Um, making it clear when you're shining the spotlight during the game, like for instance, Todd, if you're hogging the spotlight Happens and I'm trying to get, you know, Gary or Julia to, to uh, chime in, then I will simply say, Julia, it's your turn. What does your character do? And yeah. that's a signal to Todd to, you know, not talk because I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Julia or Gary or whoever. And then um, ensuring every character has moments to shine, as you say, is very key um, because players will eventually get into the pattern of realizing what you're doing and realize, oh, okay, this is so-and-so's character moment here. I'm just going to shut up for a bit. In the extreme example, if nothing else is working out, dumping the player is always an option. You can have friends who are not fun to play D&D with. <laughs> Yes, uh, yeah. just because of be behaviors and, yeah. and, and and people getting wrapped up in the excitement, they're not always behaving the way they would normally, and so sometimes it just doesn't work out, and that's fine. 
yeah, there's a chemistry to every group. Yes, yes. There's, there's, every group has a bit of alchemy to it. And uh, when, when you combine personalities, you, ne you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Right. So we come to the intermission here. And uh, on this particular slide are six images. One of them is not an official D&D book cover. Can you guess which one? <laughs> if you guessed the one in the top middle, you are right. <laughs> yes, maybe it was the art style that gave it away, I don't know. But uh, this gelatinous cube has not appeared on an official uh, fifth edition book cover before. Um, but the reason I drew this image uh, to your attention is just to sort of create a little break point in the middle of this presentation, I am here to issue the gelatinous cube challenge. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, a gelatinous cube is an iconic D&D monster that dates back all the way to the origins of the game. It is cube-shaped, it is gelatinous, it haunts dungeons, it often sort of sweeps up debris as it makes its way through 10 by 10 corridors. Uh, it's in the dark, very hard to see. In fact, many adventurers end up just walking into one, not aware that it's right in front of them. And sometimes it sneaks up on adventurers from behind and engulfs them. And that's bad because gelatinous cubes have acidic enzymes that will dissolve flesh. So this fun, not particularly intelligent monster uh, gets a lot of use, but here's my challenge to DMs everywhere. Right now, try to think of the most interesting or unusual use of a gelatinous cube. Um, maybe it's one that you've actually experienced before or used before, or maybe it's one that, uh, uh, an idea that you're just pulling out of the sky right now. So I'm gonna go with gelatinous cube with a vampire in the middle that is stuck, it has lived who knows how many years inside of this gelatinous cube that has been feeding on it for maybe a hundred years, but it keeps on regenerating over and over again. So this kind of withered husk of a vampire is in the center of the gelatinous cube, constantly feeding it. And so that gelatinous cube is in the dungeon and they have to face off with this horrible, undead, ooze-like conglomeration. What might be fun about that encounter is that when you kill the ooze, it basically frees the vampire that can then start regenerating normally and suddenly you're fighting the second monster. That's super fun. The other thing I like about that is the visual of going down the dark corridor and seeing this husk of a vampire floating toward you yeah. and not realizing it's not actually floating, it's suspended in the cube and if you run up to fight it, blurp, you're going to run right into the cube. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I'll share one idea of my own, and that is kind of similar to yours. Only in this case, uh, the gelatinous cube absorbed and dissolved a master thief who happened to be the head of a thieves guild. And rather than simply being dissolved, the thief's consciousness became one with the cube. And now the cube believes it is the master thief and is leading the thieves guild. Oh my God. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to work for that gelatinous cube. Right? Right. Like yes. what if they, the infrastructure is just... Sneaky gelatinous <laughs> cube. Yes. Who knows how to dispose of anybody who, you know, literally to rise to its position. It, exactly. It's, Another... it's like being the pig farm and also the pig. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> where where yes. bodies are dumped. Right? Spoiler alert, yes. folks, stay away from a pig farm. Um, Another fun use of a gelatinous cube would be, let's say you're going into a dungeon to retrieve a, an artifact or an item. Right. Wouldn't it be fun to put the item inside the gelatinous cube so it was always moving around the dungeon and never oh. in the same place twice? Using detection on that would yes. drive. Yeah, that's great. Here's a third one. Uh, <laughs> you've probably heard of the gelatinous cube hiding out in the bottom of a pit, right? So if the characters fall into the pit, it goes blorp into it. Of course. Well, how about the ceiling pit? The characters walk along, oh. <laughs> the pit opens in the ceiling, and the gelatinous cube just drops on top of somebody. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. All right. Well, we need to move on back to our regularly <laughs> scheduled presentation. But think about gelatinous cubes. I, I do constantly. <laughs> okay. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. Another role that the DM has is as an actor. The DM is responsible for playing all of the background and supporting characters in the campaign, including the monsters, by and large. My tip is start by understanding a creature's motivation. If you always know 
what a creature wants, it becomes much easier to role play that creature and bring it to life. Right. So my question is, how do I play a Galeb Dur, which is basically a talking boulder? Right. Just by way of example. A, lean into expectations, i.e. use a deep gravelly voice. B, defy expectations. Give it the personality of a, say, rock star. <laughs> rock star, you get it? <laughs> uh, C, check its intelligence score and its alignment. Or D, think like a rock, become the rock. Oh, oh, all of them. And yeah, I wish I could become a rock sometimes. That would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> they seem very peaceful. <laughs> Interesting. Now, I would argue that the first three are all great. Uh, leaning into, into expectations is good because it's easy. You don't have to think too hard about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it like rocks probably have a gravelly voice. Okay. Yeah. I can pull that off, and your players will get it. Gravel is in the yeah. word. Yeah. If if the if the Gale Dur talked in a high squeaky voice, the players might go, you know, they might go, what's that? Um, gravelly voice expected. But I always think it's nice when acting out a creature to find a way to defy expectations, to give it a personality that will stand out or stand apart, and it could be any one of a number of different things, uh, from just a quirk that it has. Uh, to a, a manner of speaking that is unusual, uh, to a personality that seems to be a little unexpected for the type of creature that you're encountering. But all that aside, um, a creature's stat block often has cues or clues in it that can help you role play or act out that creature. One of them is its intelligence score. Mm -hmm. If you see a creature with a low intelligence, that can affect very easily how you play that creature and alignment is another good cue. We don't prescribe alignments for creatures in D&D, but we suggest an alignment for everyone. So if you've got a devil and its alignment is typically lawful evil, lawful evil tells you something about its personality. It's kind of a tyrant, it's probably domineering, um, that kind of thing. Now, think like a rock, become the rock, sounds like something a high school drama teacher might urge you to do. Uh, now, while I ruled that out, yes. As being practical, um, I have been challenged on this one before. Right. If you imagine, if you actually sort of physically get into a hunkered down position like a rock, you know, you sort of expand your chest maybe a little, yeah. um, that could affect your performance acting. So maybe becoming the rock is actually a viable thing after all. Perfect. The DM uh, is also a director. Um, and but what I mean by director as opposed to storyteller is, a director um, needs to keep the story moving and know when uh, things are getting bogged down and then kind of uh, reorient the, the invisible camera, as it were. Mm -hmm. or, and the director has to know where to shine the camera at any given time. So my tip is let your players help steer the adventure, but when the fun is gone, move on. Right. Um, one practical way I, I do this is, let's say I have my session planned. There's a destination in mind or a conflict brewing or something that's about to happen and my players are dragging their heels in or they're, they're tangled up in a discussion that isn't going anywhere or they're just content to hang out in town and are actively sort of not striving to go where they know they need to go. One of the things I do is I will just fast forward. So they're, they're lagging around in the town, they're dickering with their shopping, they're, they're arguing about this, that, and the other thing. I'll just say, the next day you're on the road heading to the dungeon. And they're like, uh, oh, 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 okay. We've just been sort of re-centralized and the DM has basically pulled us into the future. That is a great way to get the action moving again because yeah. you've just essentially jump skipped or edited out Right. a bunch of stuff to get back to the story at hand. Now, I know some players of mine will sort of go, whoa, 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 okay, 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 we're on the road, but can, can I just go back to the town for a quick second or just flash back to buying some carrots for our mule, Charlie? Yeah. Uh, and I'll go, yeah, you got the carrots. Now you're on the road heading to the, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Just basically cut the movie and then jump to the next scene. Perfect. Question, 
My characters don't want to complete the quest laid out before them. What should I do? A. Provide additional motivation. B. Surface a more tempting quest. C. Let the players direct the story for a while. You know, just sit back, whatever. D. Tell the players you have nothing else prepared. I mean, all of the above, potentially, if you're not into improv and this is the only thing that you've got left uh, at, there at the end, yeah, I think that's a very fair thing to say, like, you were not prepared for another avenue. But uh, I do like the chaos of players sometimes, you know, subverting that adventure if they're not into it and finding their own way. You are correct. All of these things are viable options. Providing an additional motivation can help, like if they're going on a treasure hunt and the paladin's like, well, I'm not all about treasure. That's not really my bag. You can contrive something that would hook the paladin in. Um, maybe there's some, there's some noble thing that can be accomplished with the treasure, or there's some other thing at the destination that the paladin might glom onto as being important enough for them to go on the adventure you can surface a more tempting quest. It's okay if the players are really resistant to going in a direction and saying, okay, that's not working. Right. I'm gonna save that for later and see if I can maybe get them back there at a later time and instead try something else. But like you say, you have to be pretty comfortable with improv yeah. to embrace that. Uh, and you also have to be comfortable with improv if you let the players basically take the reins for a while. Yeah. And, and so saying, look guys, I have nothing else prepared. This is what we're, this is what we ought to do. Totally cool. In D&D, D&D is a game and everybody's supposed to have fun. And there is a social contract that underlies the game. The social contract being the DM will put on a good show and the players will respect the work that the DM has done to do that. And they will respect each other. Everyone will respect each other. That's the social contract. If the players are basically rebuffing what the DM has prepared, they're not, they're kind of breaking the social contract at that point. And it's okay for the DM to say, look guys, the adventure is that way. Mm -hmm. Big sign pointed in that direction. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's totally cool. Another question, the game is dragging. How do I speed things along? A, jump ahead, skipping events of little consequence. B, collapse a string of unimportant events into a montage. C, have someone kick down the door. D, play fast music in the background. <laughs> All the above again. Yes, um, you're correct. Music is a great motivator, but also uh, the uh, talking about prep, I have over prepped many a time where I've had too many beats in the adventure and I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna delete this because we are running out of time. It has happened more that way than the other way. I have very rarely had to actually create more content for the story where mostly I've just had to delete entire like NPCs or mm -hmm. uh, opportunities or you know things they had to come up against just for the, for the pacing of that adventure. Yes, absolutely. I've done the exact same thing. I've also had some villain from the past who's been absent for several sessions just show up out of nowhere, literally <laughs> kick down the door and say, it's fighting time, yeah. you know? Like, uh, so that's a perfectly viable option and it gets a game going right off the bat, you know, it gets, yeah. gets it going right away again. Uh, playing fast music, I'm, I'm not necessarily referring to Benny Hill music here, <laughs> but there is, if you, if you are a DM who does use background music in the game, right. switching to a track that has a faster pace, yeah can subliminally get the character or the player's juices going again and get them sort of thinking faster and, and anticipating um, uh, moving on to something more exciting. So moving on uh, to the dungeon master as a teacher. Right. Uh, this often comes up if you've got players in the group who don't have a lot of experience with the game. The dungeon master is often the one who's thrust into the role of teacher at the table. My tip is explain how the d20 is used, then start playing. It can be tempting to walk the players through all the sort of elements of what makes a D&D game. Like, here's your character sheet, here's your hit points, this is your armor class, this is what it means, here are your weapons and here's how much damage they do, here are all your abilities, blah, 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 your spells, blah, 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 blah. It's been my experience with new players that the sooner you get them actually playing, the better. And a lot of the rules or things on their character sheet can be discussed when they become relevant. For instance, a player doesn't need to know anything about hit points. 
until combat happens and something hits them or until they fall off a cliff and they take damage. Right. That's a great time to talk about what hit points are and what they mean in the game and how you keep track of them. You don't have to burden the player with that information up front. What you really want to burden the player with is just get their imagination going right away. It's good to know what the D20 does, however, because it is so manifestly important to most players um, at various points in the game for various reasons to pick up that D20 and roll it. So knowing that high is good, low is bad, is just, as a player, they can internalize that right away and then they can start getting into character. That's perfect. Question. One of my players has trouble deciding what their character should do on their turn in combat. How do I get them to play faster? A, use an egg timer, skipping the player if they aren't fast enough. <laughs> I, I think I've seen that, yeah. <laughs> B, signal your exasperation by rolling your eyes and sighing loudly. Awesome, that's a great way. C, suggest one or two good options. Or D, make the initiative order visible to your players. Uh, I think initiative order is really good to, to see for a lot of folks. Um, providing options once it's ground, you know, ground to a halt. Uh, not a fan of the other ones. Rolling your eyes, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the first two options are not great. Yeah. I don't think you want to put added pressure of a timer on the players and on the player in that moment because they'll just freeze. Yeah. Um, B, rolling your eyes, just that's not good. That's no. just, you're yeah. just a jerk. You're just a jerk. <laughs> um, suggesting one or two options is often great. Like just a reminder. Oh, by the way, you have cantrips. You can just do those. Or yeah. you haven't used your fireball yet. Yeah. You know that kind of thing. Uh, little prompts can help a DM or help a player narrow down the possibilities and come to a decision. And uh, making the initiative order visible is helpful because if the players can see it, they know when their turn is coming up and they can start thinking about what their character is doing before their turn actually arrives. Mm -hmm. Finally, one of the mm -hmm. biggest roles of a dungeon master and one of the hardest is the DM as improviser. Improv is basically mental gymnastics. Yeah. It's what a DM is basically doing all the time, that they're, while they're doing everything, all those other roles, they are also improvising all the time. And it, is, it can be very exhausting to keep up with several players. Each of them are doing things that are not planned. It can be taxing and it can be difficult and it requires exercise and practice, which is why my tip is, hey, improv gets easier the more you play. And until then, Embrace the unexpected. Right. Often DMs will use a technique called yes and, where player says, I want to do this wacky thing. The DM says, yes, and here's what you have to do, or here's, here's potentially um, where this might go, that kind of thing. Another option is like, no, but you can't do this, but you can maybe do this other thing, or you can try it, but it's going to be really, really hard. Um, another technique um, for, for DMs is... Uh, what my colleague Mackenzie de Armas calls uh, embracing the loading wheel. Okay. Which is, while it's true that improv gets easier the more you play, and that it's, it's good that until then you embrace the unexpected, you as a DM also have license to pause and think and take a few seconds, you know, maybe up to 10 seconds or longer, to react, to figure out what to do. Um, and you can make it transparent to your players. It's like, hey guys, uh, I, I've got a loading wheel here. The, the wheel's spinning. I'm thinking, just give me a couple seconds here and then uh, re-engage. Question, the characters are about to kill the villain in one round. How do I avoid the unexpected anticlimax? A, give the villain some extra hit points or a protracted death. Right. B, with its dying breath, have the villain summon a greater threat. C, have the villain assume a new form after its first form is destroyed. Or D, don't. Enjoy the anticlimax. Uh, I, I, I don't mind the anticlimax sometimes, but like, yeah, all those are really great options. That, that giving them a little extra hit points, 
you know, uttering a curse after they die that leads to a whole nother adventure or bringing in the actual real villain mm -hmm. of the overarching story, that kind of stuff yes. is all fantastic. Yes, having the vampire implode and then another creature sort of arise from its innards is also a great example. Yes. Or a swarm of creatures, as the case may be. Right. Um, and like you, I think it's okay to enjoy the anticlimax. And the reason I feel that way is players often are overjoyed when their characters feel badass. Yeah. And if they just pound that villain down in one round, they will remember that. That will yeah. become part of their party's story. And uh, that is often a good thing. And even narratively, there are some of my favorite mov movies are like, all of this effort to get to this one villain and the villain is gone in seconds. Yes. Sometimes that's very satisfying to me because I've yes. seen this narrative before, but yeah, like that moment where you just like, you end the villain immediately, that can be, that makes you feel like the hero. Right. Question. The characters are about to die. <laughs> How do I avoid a TPK? Okay. A. Let them die. <laughs> the dice giveth and the dice taketh away. Yeah. Um, B. Have the enemy show mercy or make a tactical error. Okay. C. Stage a timely rescue. Or D. Divine intervention. All those are viable. Uh... I avoid divine intervention, though I do always like to have a plan B. If the characters do die, I like to have a secondary adventure that has to do with them all dying. As if maybe there is there is a curse on them, or there is a deity that wants to intervene by a cost. Yes, so I actually uh, ruled out the let them die, but I actually prefer your answer. That it's it can be it can be viable if you have a plan post death right to keep the campaign going or to keep the players engaged in the campaign either as their characters or in some new form maybe they're playing ghosts for a while yeah maybe they're playing vampires for a while well, they get you trapped know. in the afterlife exactly bu so bureaucracy <laughs> so actually yeah. even though i ruled out let them die that could be a viable option if the campaign can survive it yeah 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 question how do i become a better dm a watch other DMs, B, eat your broccoli, C, build a better game table, or D, steal Matthew Mercer's mojo. I, I, I don't know. Like You should have green vegetables. I know that now that I'm older. But uh, I think stealing Matt Mercer's mojo, I would be irresponsible to condone taking his mojo. That his, that's his mojo. Find your own. So I kind of feel like Watching other Dungeon Masters is really inspiring. So I mean, that's your best option, really. I would agree with you. I, I would even go farther to say that, you know, artists learn by appreciating other artists' work. Writers get better by reading other writers um, and seeing what they do well and what they don't. I think the same is true for DMs. If you watch other DMs, you can learn from them. You can say, oh, I like what this DM does in this situation. Oh, I love how this other DM keeps the plot moving, or I love how this other DM sort of embraces the characters' backgrounds and backstories and uses that as fuel for adventures. So um, I heartily encourage the watching of other DMs, which was not available to me back in the I know. ancient days, yeah. living out in the middle of nowhere with no internet. Um, now it is a thing and we should take advantage of it. We didn't have live streams and stuff, but like maybe you'd be in a D&D game and you're like, this is how I would have done it. Yes. This is a totally okay yeah. reaction as a player to have and be like, start thinking, yes. this is the time I want Dungeon Master because this is how I would have seen this story yes. or how I would have handled things. Right. And, I, and when I finally did find a DD and d club, there were DMs there that I didn't like. Right. I thought they weren't good. And I learned from them too. Yeah. By, by experiencing them, by watching them, I saw, oh, I never want to do that. Exactly, yeah. Question, how do I know if I'm doing a good job as DM. <sighs> a, you're having fun. Yeah. B, your players are having fun. C, y'all can't wait to play again. D, you did everything Chris Perkins told you to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say, well, I'll always, I'll always say what you did what Chris Perkins told you to do, but yeah, I mean, you're gonna have, I think you're gonna have days as a dungeon master where you didn't feel like you did a good job. Or maybe you didn't have fun because you don't feel that way, but your players clearly did have fun and loved the adventure. I've had that happen. Uh, if you are having fun, you did a good job. If they're having fun and you're stressed out, you still did a good job. 
uh, if they listen to you, I feel like they, they, they've been doing a good job. Um, I actually ruled out the last one. I don't think it's actually important that uh, fair, fair. You, you do everything I tell you to do because I am just I am just one DM exactly. offering some advice. I am not to be trusted completely. <laughs> it's, it's very fair. This whole video has been like a, a trap. <laughs> it is a trap. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I have heard it said that there is no wrong way to play D&D. Yeah. I disagree. I think uh, that if nobody is having fun, yeah. you're playing D&D wrong. Yeah. But if everybody's having fun, right. you're playing D&D right. And so if you're having fun, your players are having fun, and you all can't wait to play again, congratulations. You're doing a great job as a DM. The last point I want to leave with is this. How you DM is ha as unique as how you paint or how you write. And no two DMs are alike, and that's how it should be. With that, I'd like to uh, segue into a little bit of a promotion here. The original D&D starter set had an adventure in it called Lost Mine of Fandelver. Very much beloved. A lot of people have played it at this point. A lot of people have DM'd it at this point. Um, that came out in 2014. This year, um, on September 19th, 2023, we will be releasing uh, Fandelver again, taking the original adventure and expanding it into a full-blown campaign. Um, and that campaign is called Fandelver and Below, The Shattered Obelisk. I urge folks to check it out, either the book or the D&D Beyond version, and um, experience the adventure in a whole new light. Perfect. And finally, last slide, um, if you've enjoyed this presentation, it's undoubtedly because uh, of the art that features prominently within it. Here is a picture of my dog Milo as a wizard. <laughs> and here is a list of all of the artists whose work is featured in this presentation. Thank you.